Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the um, Garden Hour with MU Extension. We are so glad that you're able to join us today. Um, my name is Donna Oftenberg, and I am uh, from the Cape Girardeau area um, down in the southeast region of the state. Um, we have lots of good information for you today, lots of great speakers. Um, I am going to put up the map for you just a second. So um, if you have any questions um, at any time, you can feel free to reach out to anybody that is uh, located around the state. You might actually take a moment and uh, look at your area of the state and pinpoint who is your horticulturist um, in your area. If it's an open spot, just contact the person next um, to you, uh, the closest one to you. Um, so um, we have lots of good speakers today. Um, let's see. Uh, Kelly has changed her name to ask your questions here. I had to make sure who was doing it today. <laughs> so if anytime you have questions, please send them to her in the text box and make sure to um, put your email address with it just in case we run out of time, then we can email you and make sure you get the information you're requesting. Um, Today, we are not going to have that weather report, um, but we will go ahead and start immediately into our different um, speakers and present presenters. So, um, Jennifer, at this point, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Donna. Good afternoon, everyone. Our first question today deals with weeds. And the question is, what is the best way to keep weeds out of my beds? And Kelly is going to answer that question. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Let me get this pulled up here. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay. Okay, so yes, let's talk a little bit about weed control and garden beds. Um, this is a, you know, a, a, a question that we get a lot about. It's a constant issue that all of us as gardeners fight. So let's talk a little bit about what we can do to keep weeds under control. All right, if my slides will advance. There we go, okay. So this is a picture that came in. Um, I think it goes with the question um, about keeping weeds under control. And whenever I see a picture of a vegetable garden or a flower garden or a garden bed that looks like this, you know, I, I know how quickly it can get out of control. I know how quickly the weeds can get out of, the, out of control and it can be very frustrating. It can be very, very frustrating. So, if the person that owns this bed is listening today, um, hopefully you can get some tips out of our little presentation we're about to do on, you know, getting this under control. Um, basically, if, if, this, if this was my bed, I would probably weed eat the entire thing back to the ground, clean it up really well, and then put down a layer of cardboard with some good uh, compost and mulch on top of that. You're going to have to smother out all of the weed seeds in this area to begin to, to get this under control. So first, let's talk a little bit about weed seeds. How do they get there in the first place? You know, no matter how good of a job we do in trying to keep weeds under control, they can come in from a lot of different sources that we might not be aware of. They can blow in on a windy day. If there is a neighboring area to your property or yard that has a lot of weeds and the weeds are allowed to go to seed, those can very easily blow in on the wind. We have a lot of weed seeds that get introduced into new areas in that way. If the area is under irrigation, especially an unfiltered system or a system that needs to be cleaned, weed seeds can travel to new areas that way. So, so definitely keep that in mind. And then also think about lawn mowing equipment, tools that you might be using, and even your shoes. You know, I often tell an example of a job I had before I came to MU Extension, I worked um, doing field research in an area that had a lot of thistle. 
And after a few months of working in this area, I noticed I was starting to get thistle in my own yard at home. And I'm pretty sure I was accidentally picking up seeds on the bottom of my shoes and not knowing it and then bringing those seeds home to my own, my own yard. So think about equipment that you're using. Think about shoes that you're wearing. They can carry around seeds and we don't even know that it's going on. If you make your own compost or you're going to be using animal manure or anything like that, um, make sure that that compost and manure have reached proper temperatures. And proper temperatures are 131 degrees for at least 15 days to destroy all viable seeds. You know, compost piles, manure, even mulch can house a lot of different weed seeds. So we need to be aware of that. And if we're making our own compost, make sure that you're monitoring that temperature to kill out any seeds that might be in there. Um, birds and other animals can also spread weed seeds. So uh, be aware of that as well. And I didn't wanna say all of that to make you uh, get discouraged, but just be aware that it may not be your fault. Weed seeds may be coming in in some different areas. So whenever it comes to garden beds, I highly recommend using mulch or straw whenever possible. Keep that soil covered. And keeping soil covered does a lot of different things for soil health, but it also prevents weed seeds from germinating. And it smothers new weed seeds that have germinated and are starting to emerge as seedlings. So keep that soil covered with, with mulch or just anything to prevent that from happening. And you can use organic mulches such as straw and, and wood chip mulch. And you can also use a landscape fabric or plastic underneath the mulch like we see here in this picture. Um, so that can certainly be used as well. And some of the newer plastic mulches are also biodegradable also. So that's just another option. My all-time favorite for garden beds, and this includes my vegetable garden or my flower beds, is to put, put down uh, cardboard or layers of newspaper. This is a great way to recycle these products and they also work well to smother out weed seeds. Now, of course, the cardboard and the newspaper will break down after a period of time and you might have to redo this every year, but I think it works very well. I've done it for years and as it decomposes, it adds organic matter into the soil as well. So put these things down and then just put a layer of straw or mulch on top of it. And as far as using straw, I'm a big fan of using straw in my vegetable garden. I've used that for years on top of cardboard. But whenever you buy a bale of straw to use as a mulch, do be aware that it can contain either weed seeds or seeds from the straw itself. So before spreading that out in your garden, I'd like to leave those bales somewhere for several weeks and then any seeds that are in there will germinate and start to die back. And after that dieback process takes place, then you can spread it in your garden or bed areas. Um, there are herbicides that can be used. You can spray the area and get rid of any weeds that are already there. Um, there are also some pre-emergence. Fall is a good time to put down pre-emergent herbicides because we have a lot of uh, cool season weeds that are starting to germinate now. And if we can prevent them from growing all winter long, we'll have less of a problem in spring. But whatever type of product you use, make sure that you're reading labels carefully, that it is treating the type of weed that you want to target, that it's safe to use around vegetables if you're using it in a vegetable garden, and that you're protecting yourself um, when applying as well. And as far as vegetable gardens go, I am a big proponent in monitoring. I try to go out at least every week or every two weeks and keep my garden weeded. 
if you can stay on top of it, weeds are much easier to pull when they're little as opposed to when they're very large. So just spend some time. I have this little green garden seat here in the in the slide. I love it. I go out there and sit on my little garden seat and I uh, pull all of my weeds and it just really helps to, to keep them from getting out of control. And Jennifer, I think that's all I have on that. All right, thank you, Kelly. Our next question is, what is the best way to prevent young fruit trees from sun scald? If a latex paint solution is recommended, what time of the year should it be applied and must a tree be a certain age or caliper? Some of my young grafted fruit trees have calipers just larger than a pencil. Is that too young to paint? And Eli is going to answer this question. All right. Uh, everybody see that okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so just to reiterate the question is, uh, what is the best way to prevent young fruit trees from sun scald? And can you use latex paint? How should I use it? When should I use it? And I have some very young grafted trees. Is that too young? So what we're talking about today is sun scald or fruit trees. Over here on the right side, you can see some a group of trees next to a canal that have all been painted white to prevent sun scald, uh, even as they mature. And on the left side, you can see uh, the damage that sun scald uh, does to a tree. So what causes sun scald? Um, it's pretty interesting. There's a sun scald and sun burn, but sun scald happens in the winter time, and that's what we're most worried about. Um, you get nice, warm, sunny. Doesn't even do that warm, but nice sunny days in the winter time. And that south southwest side, uh, the dormant cells will uh, think that it's uh, springtime, and they will start uh, warming up, becoming non-dormant. And then, unfortunately, when the sun goes down, you get that huge difference in temperature. They freeze and burst, causing them to die which leaves you with uh, the problem you see there on the left, a big dead spot. And so you can see here, uh, you get that large unsightly wound that I was talking about. Here's another example on the right. On the left side, you can see um, the dead cambium tissue where it's black on the picture on the left. And then further to the left where it wasn't uh, facing south or southwest where the sun didn't shine, you have healthy cambium. So your tree will continue to grow, but you have this huge area that is dead which is um, a problem to say the least. Um, and so this, uh, right, you can, pathogens can enter through there, rot can enter through there, not treated long enough, you can even start to get mushrooms to grow there because the wood is dying. It's definitely not, especially as a young tree, how you're gonna want to uh, get off to a good start to have a, a long life of a healthy tree providing a nutritious, delicious fruit for you and your family. Um, so how can you avoid it? So there's a few different recommendations out there. 50-50 uh, of interior latex with water. Some people say full strength latex. These are all from uh, educational institutions. And you wanna apply this latex to your uh, tree in late fall after the leaves have dropped. You can spray it on there. You can use a roller, you can use a brush. You can put on a car wash mitt and dip it in there. However you wanna do it, you can cover it. Um, Another way, which doesn't involve any paint, are white tree guards um, applied in the fall and removed in the spring. Um, there's other shadings that you can use, a lot of homemade things, even milk cartons and whatnot, um, but you definitely need to remove those in the spring. Interestingly, the susceptible trees are not just fruit trees, but they're ones that have a thin bark and a dark colored bark with a southwest exposure. <laughs> I learned this uh, researching this is that uh, really causes trouble on apple, cherry, crab apple, peach, and a bunch of other landscape trees. Um, and unfortunately with time, uh, peaches and plums and cherries can get worse the older they get, more susceptible. So the answer to the question is, um, since his trees are so young, he's gonna wanna use tree guards for the first two years. Then after that, when they're more than two years old, then he can start painting them. And uh, you can put the tree guards on in the fall, take them off in the spring, <laughs> this uh, picture of a tree guard is from the Fedco catalog. They're out of Maine. They have a bunch of orchard supplies. There's other orchard suppliers. Um, I do like Fedco. It's a 
cooperative and you can join and become a member and get a discount. And then if you, uh, they also do volume discounts. And so uh, here's the references, I'll put them in the chat. And so that's uh, how to prevent sun scald and the right age to do it. All right, that's what I got. Thank you, Eli. Sure thing. Our next question is about rhubarb. And this question's a little lengthy, so just bear with me. It says, earlier this year, I transplanted a young potted rhubarb plant in an open area of my yard. I kept it watered this summer and it seemed to do well despite the heat and lack of rainfall. The plant received strong sunlight during the summer growing season, but will receive weaker filtered sunlight during the winter. I have wire fencing surrounding the plant to protect it from deer that frequently browse through the yard. I read that I should give it three years of growing before harvesting any of the stalks. What should I do now to prepare the rhubarb plant for the upcoming winter months? And Kelly is going to answer this question. Hey. Okay, let's go back one here. All right, Jennifer, can you see this? Well, I could now my screen. Okay, yes, I can. You're good. Okay. Okay, all right, there we go. Okay, well, uh, the the question was correct so every um so so for young plants you want to wait about two to three years before you harvest you want to just kind of leave them in the ground let them get established let them develop a good root system and then you can start harvesting a little bit and then you know as far as going into winter I would definitely mulch around those plants just a basic wood chip mulch would be fine but I would put uh, several inches of mulch around it to help protect that, that root system, and I think you'll be fine. Um, so for those that may be interested in growing rhubarb and haven't grown it before, it's pretty easy to grow. It is a perennial vegetable plant, just meaning it'll come back year after year, and it produces large floppy leaves that are attached to the stalks um, that are going to grow from short thick underground rhizomes. Uh, rhubarb does need full sun, but it does benefit from having some afternoon shade during the hot, dry part of the summer. So just keep that in mind if you are growing new plants. So you can propagate rhubarb in the spring. So if you have a neighbor that has a very large established plants, you can dig up the crown of that plant and divide it um, into different plants from the crown. A very easy way to propagate rhubarb. Uh, one thing you do want to keep in mind is that only the stalks can be eaten. The rest of the plant, the roots, the leaves, they all contain a toxin. So just make sure that you're only eating the stalk of the plant. And again, mulch it for winter protection. But rhubarb is, is certainly one of my favorite. I love strawberry rhubarb pie and jellies and things like that. So I encourage you to grow it and uh, yeah, just mulch it well going into the winter. All right, thank you. So as you all know, the state of Missouri is really dry right now and we are in a drought situation. In some parts of the state where we are in extreme drought even. And Donna is going to talk to us about planting in a drought. Okay. So as Jennifer just alluded to, um, the most, if, most if not all of Missouri is now in some type of drought rating. And if you'll look at the map, you can see where there's no longer any white anywhere on the map. And white indicated no drought. So those that were two weeks ago that were had no drought have now moved, been moved up to abnormally dry. And then, of course, the other ratings have also went up, too. So just take a look at the map and find where you're at and, and note how bad your drought is. And I did put the ratings over to the left. And a lot of us have been talking about drought 
A lot of us have been talking about, should you be planting uh, during the drought? And what I wanted to do is just briefly discuss some of the reasons why or why not. And in that way, all of you, you know, depending on where you're at on the map, you might think about this and say, okay, you know, I'm, it's best for me to wait till spring or it might be west, best till we get some more rain or, hey, I'm in one of those areas that it's not really that bad yet. So it might be safe for me to plant. So um, it's, it's more of an open dialogue for me to um, talk about this. Um, some of the drought challenges that we have is, one is there is very little predictions um, of rainfall events in our area for the state of Missouri. Some areas may have some uh, rain coming next Monday and Tuesday, but for the most part, the seven to 10 day outlook is still dry. Um, and that really leaves areas um, where the ground is very hard and very dry. And, and it's not, um, I've been hearing from a lot of uh, growers and a lot of gardeners that it's hard to dig into and it's um, hard to get anything planted. So if you've bought a lot of plants, you might start thinking about some of this, should you be planting or not? Um, the other thing that I always try to remember is a lot of these plants that we already have in our existing landscape will pose as competition for anything that we might plant. So that's talking about grass, that's talking about perennials, that's talking about shrubbery or even trees. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about putting in more landscape plants. The other thing you might wanna think about is a lot of these nurseries promote using fertilizer as you're planting. And in times of drought, fertilizing is a is a no-no. And so just think about that as you're, as you're thinking about planting. And then of course we have the mulching conundrum. And I say it's a conundrum because in, in normal years, we are, we are encouraged to, uh, to mulch, to conserve moisture, to help with the um, keeping the plants a little warmer in the winter and so on and so forth. But when you're in a drought condition and your soils are already dry, mulching is not the best thing to do because all you're doing is insulating a already dry soil. So if you um, are in a, have a tradition of normally going out and mulching in the fall, you might back off and think, okay, do I really need to be mulching? Now, if you truly want to plant and you truly want to mulch and so on and so forth, an option would be to go ahead and start watering on a regular basis to try to get that soil moistened back up, to try to get those plants um, to where they can be mulched again. And so just keep those things in mind. And I know I keep saying that, but it's not a simple answer this year of whether to plant or not plant. So this is what a couple colleagues and I talked about earlier. Only plant if you are in an area with abnormally dry to moderate drought status. If you are in any of those areas that are in the more severe drought status, I wouldn't plant at all. Another scenario would be if rain is forecasted, and, and I'm talking about more than a tenth of an inch or more than a quarter of an inch. Once that rain is passed and it has moistened the soil, then you might be okay to plant. Another option is if you're willing to water and keep watering. That's the key, keep watering because a lot of our soils are extremely, extremely dry. One watering won't do it. And I've been telling people that if they want to plant, you might want to water really well two days prior to that or one day prior to that and get that ground moistened up so it's going to be easier to dig and easier to plant. And keep in mind, once that plant is in the ground, you need to water weekly if, you're, if you've planted evergreens and weekly if there's perennials that are staying green, because if they're staying green, they're staying active. And then of course, on all others, monitor that soil moisture on any of your deciduous plants. So that's getting out there and feeling the soil and digging around and making sure that it's going to have enough moisture to get through the uh, dry winter months. And then of course, the other thing, if you're wanting to plant, there's a lot of research that says that if you amend your soils, it will, it will condition the clay soil particles to, to moisten up a little bit better. 
once clay gets dry, it tends to stay dry and you have a lot of runoff. And so if you can pre-moisten it or mix um, amendments into that clay soil to break it up some, you can. it's more likely to get it to take up the water. So um, Jennifer, that's, that's what I have. And, and I'm really open to any questions uh, that anybody has. Feel free to email me about planting in the drought um, if you wanna talk a little more about it. Thank you, Donna. Staying on the same topic of drought, Pong is now going to talk about stress-related dieback of evergreen conifers. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Peng Tian uh, from the MU Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, focus on the stress-related dieback issue for evergreen conifers. As you can see in the first slides, uh, there are four categories of, uh, of plants. Um, there are, uh, the first category is one of our most familiar one, it's uh, deciduous uh, broadleaf plants. Uh, they're showing the best color now, the four color. Uh, the, this category includes the oak trees, um, sycamore trees, maple trees, and uh, they will shed leaves in the winter. And do you know that they are also uh, ever, uh, the, uh, conifer tree that are also deciduous. We have one in front of reading. It is a cypress tree, and they also show fall color and a shed leaf, uh, shed needles. Uh, for evergreen uh, broadleaf plants, this category includes um, boxwood. I think in Missouri it's very common, and the holly, uh, sometimes azalea and the rhododendron. Uh, today I got. I would like to focus on the the fourth category, which is also one of the uh, most familiar. Uh, plants uh, of you guys, uh, which is the evergreen conifer plants. This category of plants includes uh, spruce, um, pine tree, uh, juniper, a variety, uh, but they do have some uh, dieback issue. Every time you saw uh, the needle blights or needle dropping, that could be an indicator of uh, potential environmental stress or disease stress, or sometimes maybe just completely normal, uh, like uh, this photo, that's the second slide, uh, which shared by Miss Debbie Kelly last year. And I also showed that in one of my presentation. Uh, and initially you thought you have some stress related dieback issue, but after one week, as the old needle uh, drop off, it turned back to green and healthy. So this is just a normal process of season yellowing. Uh, and uh, it's very, it's completely healthy. Uh, I mean, for a process. However, uh, this photo I took just a couple of months ago in Colombia while I was waiting for the lights. And you can see that those bunch of uh, uh, evergreen conifers over there are starting dying out. The entire canopy turned to be brown. And here, this is a very basic uh, process of digital uh, diagnosis. So I had to think about some uh, factors uh, could be likely affected or less likely affect this issue. So let's look at the two categories. What about droughts? This year, like Ms. Donna has mentioned that, we have a really tough year. And uh, this harsh dry weather definitely had a huge impact on evergreen trees. What about the soil condition? The different, the pH level and compaction of soil can also cause the decline of the trees. Uh, established failure could be because what if they were planted last year and they are very young and gonna take up to three years or, or even five years for them to well established in the soil. And sometimes the failure of the establishment can cause the gardening roots because the development of roots will be um, limited by the, by the bad soil condition. Sometimes if you have a lawn care companies, so they're doing more on the lawn control, they use it more can cause trunk injury. Uh, that could be, so uh, that could be all the likely factor affecting this. What about winter injury? It really depends on the weather. If we have harsh winter in the beginning of the year, it may take a couple of months to show the symptoms. And uh, herbicide damage, it really depends on the lawn care company, whether it is spray herbicide in this area, but skip those, those area, that also could be. So I think that's all the likely factor. Let's talk about the less likely. Uh, factors. Uh, poor drainage. Um, this year's dry year, I don't think there's a lot of uh, uh, poor drainage issue or rural disease 
uh, due to overwater issue, unless uh, this area they have some uh, dripping line or some leaking over here, and this area happened to be the lower area, and all the other plants were not affected, but all of this has been affected, and those rural disease cause a systemic vascular issue causing the tree death. Needle blight disease. Um, normally, needle blight disease uh, are caused by uh, fungal pathogens. Uh, I was more interested in those, uh, the trees on the edge, when you look at that, uh, the yellowing, you can see there is a trend in the middle of a transition from green to yellow, but they didn't show that in patches or in sectional dieback. And then you can barely see whether it's inside out or on the top. They are more uniform. That had given me an indication that this is not fungal pathogen related needle blight disease. Uh, they could be the whole systemic dieback issue. Um, what about insects, bagworms, or Spider mite could be because this year is really hot and dry, but uh, for this scale of damage, insect damage may not cause that big issue like that. Mm, in proper mulch, I cannot really see the, whether there's mulch over there. And salt damage really depends on whether the city uh, spray any salts in that area. But normally, if you have a sidewalk here, all the other plants may also be affected. So this is how I can like line up all the factors that can cause this issue. Of course, this is the best guess I can give. I think this is due to environmental stress. And, uh, and uh, um, unless I have uh, like uh, uh, the physical sample sent to my lab or I visit this on site to look at the, uh, the uh, living condition of the trees, um, I cannot give a really decisive or uh, confirm my hypothesis, but uh, probably it's associated with the, the drought stress. So for the drought stress, um, sometimes you will be like, uh, oh, I water, I didn't water my plants. My plant looks fine this year. However, unfortunately, symptom of needle discoloration may be delayed due to the waxy coating on the needles. You may not see the dieback this year, but it may show up next year. What if we have harsh winter early next year? It may show up. Secondly, dieback symptoms may show up within the first six years of planting. The established filler together with the transplant shock can really affect the growth of the plants. Uh, lastly, if you have your green tree that had the defoliation over 60%, it will likely lead to the tree decline and eventually, sadly, death of the plants. So what can I do with my trees? Um, first, the brown needles will not grow back and dead branches will stay dead. So you had to hold your tears and move on and prepare for the next year. Uh, something you can do, trim the dead branches in the winter to avo avoid pathogen in infection and uh, do a soil test for fertilization suggestions. And MU Extension offer this uh, program um, and uh, uh, feel free to send a soil sample to, uh, to us. Improve drainage and continue to water. Um, um, thanks to Ms. Donna, she already gave a really um, wonderful presentation about how to water uh, the trees. Uh, lastly, remove the dead trees and uh, plant native evergreen trees that are, are less susceptible to the harsh winter or hot drought weather. So that's all I have. Um, thank you. All right, thank you, Paul. And now Tamara is going to do friend or foe. Hi, everyone. All right, I'm about to access the, the poll. And if you haven't played this before, you're going to take a look at the insect that's on the screen and you're going to tell us whether it's a friend or a foe. I also give you the choices neither and it depends. So you, see, you should be able to see it at this point. So go ahead and start entering your vote. I'll give you about 10 seconds. Five more seconds. We have a lot of people putting in their vote at the last second. So go ahead. If you have any, if you have, I'll give you another second to put it in. Three, two, one. All right, I'm ending the poll and now I will share the results. So most of you said that this is a foe and I have to admit, I agree with you. This is a foe. This is um, what's called a mealy bug. 
And I have two spellings on there because I've seen both in the literature, but it does seem to usually be written as one word, but I did want to point it out that it can be written as both. So mealybugs get their common name from those white waxy secretions that kind of cover their entire bodies. It's a mealy texture and they kind of can look like a blob of fungus. So they can be confused as that and maybe hard to spot. They're actually in the order Hemiptera. This is the order that also contains scales and white fly and aphids. Um, more distantly related are the true bugs, and that's why it can be spelled as two different words. Some of these insects, the aphids and scales, can also cover their bodies with white waxy secretions, so that can actually make it challenging to identify this insect in the field. In some climates, in the warmer climates like Florida or even the Bahamas, mealybugs are a serious pest on many citrus and ornamental plants. Here in Missouri, though, um, we don't have the same struggles because we don't have the same plants, nor do we have that tropical temperature all year round. So the winter is able to, to help mediate the damage. However, many of us have indoor plants that are tropical and we might keep those outdoors in the summer or we might put them in a greenhouse and then we might bring them back into the house. And, and when we do that, we can actually bring mealybugs back into our house to um, attack the plants that we have in the house year round. So, so that um, reiterates the, the importance of making sure that you inspect your plants before you bring them inside. Now, some mealybug species, they can overwinter as nymphs and eggs. Um, however, outside resurgences in the spring, it usually comes from um, introducing uh, pests or plants that already are infested with mealybug. So um, if to, to tell you a little bit more about this pest, the typical female mealybug, they can be as small as a 16th of an inch to an eighth of an inch long, though some species are up to a quarter of an inch. The females typically have white waxy oval bodies and they have functional legs for a while. Um, they, they have a, a cottony appearance. Males on the other hand are much smaller. They usually have wings and they're rarely seen. These bugs are slow moving. Uh, they're usually found in clusters and, and often along leaf veins. They might be found on the underside of leaves. They might also be found in joints of the plants. They are piercing sucking insects. So that means that they feed on plant sap. sap. And so then um, when they're feeding on the plant sap, they also can exude a, a sticky sweet substance called honeydew. And that can cause the leaves to become sticky. Um, they can attract ants. You also can end up with a black mold called sooty mold that can grow on that honeydew. And it gives the leaves a really dirty, yucky appearance. Uh, plants that have mealybugs, they actually can have distorted leaves. They can become weak. They might wilt. They might turn yellow and they can eventually die. So mealybugs actually can affect all plant parts depending on the species. Uh, sometimes they can be found on roots. They can be found on the root crowns. They can even be on stems, twigs, and of course, the leaves and flowers and fruit. So um, this is definitely something you're going to want to look for, especially if you have plants that are outside that you bring into your house. Um, if you do have them, uh, well, first of all, try to prevent having the problem in the first place. If you are acquiring new plants, it's a good idea to, to isolate them so that you can really check to see if, if they're there. So that gives you a chance to really look. It also gives you a chance to, if you isolate them for about a week or two, um, maybe even up to three weeks, before bringing them in, that means that if there's any small crawlers, then they'll have a chance to get older and you'll be able to see them easier. So it's a good idea to isolate your plants before introducing them to your other household plants. Uh, it, if you do need to, um, if you do find them, you can remove them. Uh, you can hand pick them off sometimes. Um, you could use a cotton swab. If you soak it in rubbing alcohol, that can help. If you are if you find them outdoors, sometimes you can use a strong stream of water to get them off. Um, if you need something more than that, there are insecticidal soaps that can help um, and uh, horticulture oils that can help. Um, and there are a few chemical insecticides that are available, but make sure that you follow the labeled instructions. And then um, to, to prevent future problems, make sure that you inspect your plants regularly. That's during the summer when they're outdoors and, and definitely when you have plants indoors when you're bringing them in and then just inspect your plants regularly so you don't have a problem indoors. So that's what I have on mealybug. Um, but while I have your attention, I do just want to point out that I am going to be teaching a class starting next week. Now, I realize that we're wrapping up the gardening season. We're headed into the holiday season. So you might not be thinking about uh, honing your gardening skills. 
However, this is actually a great time to get ready for gardening next year. Um, if you want to be planning on how to put in a landscape um, and to, to do your vegetable garden, all while having um, being an environmental steward, this might be a class that you could consider. So it actually starts next week. It's going to be on Wednesdays. We won't have it the week of Thanksgiving, but it is via Zoom. So if you are interested, I'll drop the link in the chat um, or you can scan the QR code. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tamara. And now Donna's gonna talk about planting bulbs in containers, which might be a good option since the ground is pretty dry from this drought. So go ahead, Donna. Okay. We're actually gonna try something different today. Um, uh, we're gonna try to do it live. I know in the past we've done mostly PowerPoints and, and talked, um, but today we're gonna do more of a demonstration. Um, and so, uh, today I have actually brought, bought some bulbs, um, a trowel, a container, and of course, potting mix. Um, and I did not bring a watering can, but everybody knows what a watering can looks like. So the big thing with bulbs is when you buy them, make sure that they are firm and they're not uh, mush mushy. So basically feel around when you're buying them. I bought this at the local, uh, retailer. Um, there are most lots of selection right now with the bulbs, but as we move closer and closer to the end of the year, um, you're not going to be able to find as many. So definitely buy your stuff now and you can hold them over or you can go ahead and start planting. We're starting to cool down quite a bit. Um, if you want to plant in um, the container because the ground is too hard, what we recommend is planting or the depth of planting should be three times the size of the bulb. And so with tulips, you're gonna be looking at a five inch depth. Whereas I also got crocus. Crocus are gonna be more like a two to three inch depth. And so what my plan is, is to have a layer of tulips that I'm gonna add soil on top of it. And then we're going to put in the crocus on top. And then um, we'll have two things blooming in this pot in the spring. And so I already put about a quarter um, filled the pot up about a quarter of the way. And so what we will do is we will just go and nestle them into the soil. I know this is hard to show, but I'm just going to put them, arrange them around in the bottom here in approximately five inches deep. That's what we're going to go. <clears throat> and then we're going to come over here and put more mix on top of it. Now, this is a potting mix. Um, we're seeing more and more mixes that are what they classify as peat free. So they don't have peat moss in it. This one is one of those. It has a lot of bark in it. It has a lot of um, uh, ground up things. Um, and, and if you just look at it, it just, it doesn't look like it has, it has any peat in it. And it may have compost in it because it is marketed as a um, organic type mix. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to, um, Put more soil on top. And one thing I did forget to show you was the trowel. Um, I uh, went ahead and put um, line this with silver so that everybody could see the measuring points on it. I like these trowels because, you know, a lot of times we can approximate depth, but I like to be more exact sometimes, and it just depends on what I'm doing. And so I've added. Uh, Let's see, I've added probably about three inches of soil so far. And so when I get to three inches, I'm gonna stop and I'm going to put the crocus in because the crocus, you want to have at least two inches on top. And so I'm just gonna arrange those in here just so, well, they all fall down. So you're just gonna arrange them around. So everybody can see that. And then uh, once I have those arranged, and you want to always make sure that the point is up and the root area is down. If you're not sure which is the top and which is the bottom, then sometimes we can lay them on the side or what is perceived to be the side, and then they will come on up. And so once we have those in, we just go ahead and put about two inches worth of soil. Once again, I'm going to use my trowel 
two inches is about right there. So I'm just gonna fill in, I don't know if everybody can see that, fill in to about where it's two inches on top of there. And we can go up to three, so I'm gonna add a little more. And I wanna leave a pretty good lip <clears throat> for uh, being able to water into it. Now, once it's done, once you're done planting, you're going to water it in, um, and then you're going to take it outside um, and you're going to put it in a protective spot. Now, if you're in the southern part of Missouri, you can leave this sitting out in the garden or let it sit out from maybe in front of your porch. If you're in mid-Missouri or above, then you want to put it up against a wall um, and so that it has a little bit of protection. Um, but if everything goes well, um, next spring when we start to warm up, you should see the crocus first. And then as we go a little bit longer, um, you'll have the early tulips that come up next. Now, if you really want to get a combination going, you can actually do um, different other different kinds of bulbs in here too. But I'm just sticking some, uh, staying with simple and doing the crocus and the tulips. Um, and then, like I said, hopefully by spring, um, you will have uh, bulbs coming up. So back to you, Jennifer. All right, good job, Donna. Thanks for doing that. Okay, now uh, Manoj is going to talk about overseeding of a lawn uh, and that it's not too late. And he's going to also mention winter weed control. Thank you. Uh, so I don't, I'm on my cell phone today, so I don't have a presentation, but I'll quickly talk about, uh, you know, once you put down seeds, of course, we know that September is the ideal time for putting down seeds for cool season lawns. And October 15 is the, I mean, the traditional deadline that we said and recommend that uh, beyond that date, it's gonna be hard if you are working against the mother of nature uh, to grow your grass seeds. Uh, but again, there is some, there is some uh, thinking going around, you know, with the change in climate and the weather patterns that we see recently, uh, there might be some window beyond October 15th as well, as we expect to see longer growing season. Um, so for instance, if you have been out in the vacation or you were just too lazy in the September and October, early October, then don't just um, wait until next spring. So if you need to repair your lawn, then I would personally suggest that go ahead and put down seeds if your lawn needs some repair uh, because uh, looks like we, I mean, we, even in the until the last of October, we can put down seeds and grow grass seeds. Okay, uh, traditionally we thought September is the ideal uh, planting time, but we know what September was this year. There was no precipitations, and the folks that have put down sept, uh, seeds on September had a hard time growing grass. So, you know, things are changing. So, uh, just uh, giving that heads up and that new uh, current new interest and uh, ideas coming around in terms of seeding recommendations. Now, uh, the, most of the times when we put down seeds, we do not continue watering and that's a concern because for at least two weeks, you need to, you need to uh, keep watering at least two to three times a day. Uh, you just need to mist irrigation okay which we, what we call misting irrigations just at about top one inch you have to um, wait that just the top one inch unlike your summer irrigation where we do deep irrigations here we are just misting that um, top one inch of your soil so that your seeds can have good soil seed contact to grow roots down there and one thing another thing what I, I want to point out is the mowing so people generally daily daily they're mowing they do not uh mow their grass early enough, they will let it grow tall and that becomes very leggy and does not develop good vigor. So ideally what we suggest is once your grass reaches to a height of two and a half inch, and if you have a blue grass even two inch height, then you can begin mowing. That happens generally about three to four weeks after you put down seeds. So do not wait until your grass reaches to three inch height. That's a little bit late. So you start, uh, begin mowing as soon as your grass reaches two and a half inch or even two inch height, okay? That will help to develop more vigor and strength to your new grass seeds. Now, let's talk about this weed control. Um, many of you have heard that this 
fall timing and now October is the very good time to spray on your weeds. Uh, the weeds like a broadleaf weeds like dandelions, clover, ground ivy, henwheat, those type of weeds that we have seen flowering in the springtime. Uh, and you were struggling I'm to manage here those. pushing buttons and nothing's working. <laughs> if you are struggling to manage those weeds in the springtime, then now is the time to spread those weeds. Okay. If you had spread those weeds, then the lions, clover, hen weeds in the springtime when they were flowering, you might not, you might not have a good success uh, because um, plants were working against you. Okay. Uh, so what happens in the spring is the weeds. They put down all those nutrients up towards the flower parts uh, and not down to the roots because they are already mature and they are in the flowering stage. In contrast, now in the fall time, September, October, November, what happens is they are just germinating, growing young, and they are growing actively. And they are putting those nutrients down to the roots from your leaf surface. So if you spray herbicides in the leaves of those weeds, those herbicides will be taken down to the roots and whole plants died. So that's how herbicides worked most efficiently. So the herbicides that you use for clovers uh, uh, have to be something that has dicamba or MCPP. And um, if you are wanting to control dandelions, you have to have a herbicide that has 2,4-D, okay? Again, I said to you that for the clover, you need dicamba. For dandelions, you, might, you need 2,4-D. There's is just a few of those. There are many other options. But what I'm trying to say here is, if you have dandelions and clovers and hay bees and all kinds of weeds, then you may have to go for a herbicide that has more than one ingredients, okay? So in the, in the market, in the garden store, you can find the products that has more than one active ingredients and that way you can play safe uh, because most of the times these active ingredients are very specific to uh, certain weeds. So go and look for the products that has more than one ingredients like 2,4-D, dicamba, MCPP, and then you will have more success in killing those weeds. And that will be all from my side. Thank you. And get it back to Jennifer again. All right. Thank you, Manoj. Well, the spotted lanternfly has become a problem in several parts of the United States. And uh, we hope that we don't find it here. But Pong is going to give us an update on the spotted lanternfly now. Hello, y'all. My name is Spotted Lanternfly. Today, I'm gonna give you a quick introduction about myself. You can see how beautiful I am. I have beautiful wings, beautiful color. I hope I can impress you today. So I'm gonna share my screen. Looks so like I know how to use computer, right? All right, let's start. Again, my name is Spotted Lanternfly, and uh, this is my scientific name. I don't know how to see that. Come on, I'm a bug. I mean, what do you ex what do you expect me to to know? Okay. In my spare time, I like to hang out with my pals. We like to go to the bar, have a couple of drinks. We love um, sucking those sap from the from the plants. Although you know that we are vegetarian, but uh, we're not that picky, not like you guys. KFC, Popeyes, out of bags. We only eat the sap from the plants and we have good appetite. We can infect over 70 different plant species, including grape, apple, walnut, and uh, oak tree, all type of ornamentals. However, one thing I want to mention we have our own favorite, which is called tree of heaven. Look at the color, look at the juicy leaves. They say the favorite plants. I don't know why you human being always label them as invasive species, but these are our favorites. I came to this country in 2014, Pennsylvania is my hometown. And, uh, and we started like here. And we, our, as our family getting bigger and bigger, we travel around and now we have in New York, New Jersey, uh, Maryland, and uh, we have multiple generations and uh, we have brother and sister everywhere across the Northeast area. You know what, what we gonna go? Where we gonna 
stay next step. Missouri, because Missouri is one of our perfect places to stay. As you can see in this map, the risk of us is really high and we're gonna go there. You know what? One of my family member have already tried. Unfortunately, he tried to smuggle from Pennsylvania to St. Louis. Unfortunately, he didn't make it. Poor boy, we're gonna try one more time. Let's switch a gear and talk about more personal life. We produce the best egg mass in the whole world. Water resistant, cold resistant, ISO 9001 certified, and our egg mass can attach to almost anything. You name it, vehicles, woods, structures, and uh, human equipment that allow us to travel around the world. And they can be sticky to anything like human belongings. Once the season started, there are two stages of NIF. And now in the fall, we turn to the last stage which is adult stage. And that's the best time you can see us and you can identify that us. And that's also the best time we start mating. And we're gonna, each one of us can produce over 30 to 60 eggs. And um, that's how our family getting bigger and bigger. By the way, if you are trying to look for us, don't be confused with those stuff. They're just knockoff. They're not as pretty as I am. They're not as beautiful as I am. Look at how beautiful we are. But those are as easily to be confused with us. If you really want to look for us, once you saw me take a photo and uh, collect the insect and report to MDA. And I hope to see you soon. Okay, see you in Missouri. That's all I have. Have a good day, guys. All right, thank you, Spotted, Spotted Lantern Fly, for that update. Okay, we're about uh, to close out for the day, but I want to mention a program real quick since we have about three minutes left. And I'd like to mention that on November 10th in Green City, Missouri, which is in Sullivan County, that's about 18 miles west of Kirksville, we are having a Women in Agriculture workshop. And we are going to have topics on succession and estate planting, weed management. We're going to have a discussion with the Missouri State Fair Queen because she's from our area. We're going to talk about farm leases and current rental rates. And I'm going to do a program called Live Life in Full Bloom. And if you would like to attend that workshop and you know, you're from the Northeast Missouri area, you can call the Adair County Extension Center to get on our roster or you can email me if you know my email address. There is no uh, charge to attend. It is supported uh, by the Salt Water Board districts of about four counties in this area. So again, it's women in agriculture. And if you're interested, contact the Adair County Extension Center or send me an email and I'll put you on the roster. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Donna to close us out. Okay, so um thank you for joining us today um my slide to go there we go um if any of you i know we've shared a lot of links um so if you would like to save all those links you can save the chat by going all the way over to the right um to the bottom of the chat where it has three little dots beside the smiley face click on those dots and you can save the chat to your computer um Okay, so remember that we do have a um, live stream available and the individual snippets, and you can find those on YouTube um, at the MUIPM site. Um, and we have lots of different recordings, lots of different snippets. And, uh, you know, if you're just sitting around uh, needing something to do, that'd be uh, great to start um, learning more. Um, if you wish to ask any question during, uh, to be covered during the garden hour, um, you can go to um, 
back to the registration page and you can ask your question there you'll have to re-register in order to ask the question um and remember we are monthly now um so our next one will be november 16th and so we look forward to uh having you uh come back and join us so uh have a good day